Last time I was on the show, I talked about creationism, which is sort of a, a morbid fascination of mine. Uh, I kind of talked about the history of creationism. And one of the things that creationists say a lot is that when you, when you uh, accept evolution as the scientific theory, as the reigning scientific theory, or as they would like to say, if you believe in evolution, mm -hmm. uh, then you have an evolutionary worldview, and that spawns all sorts of terrible things. Uh, just before I came here, I pulled a quote off of a typical creationist website, where in which they said, what are the fruits of an evolutionary worldview? Cheapening of human life, unwarranted elevation of animal life, and why shouldn't men act like animals? I like that unwarranted elevation of animal life. Yeah. Can't... As in, they really don't deserve any kind of special treatment. Right. But, I mean, you know, <laughs> their point is that uh, evolution yeah. makes you anti-religious, and it also makes you have absolutely no conscience, so you're right. free to go slaughter around slaughtering each other indiscriminately because that's the way it works in nature, according yeah. to them. And... Um, we heard a lot of that actually in the last textbook hearings when people would stand up and say that the reason we have so many school shootings nowadays is because kids are taught evolution. <laughs> I'd love to know what, what kind of studies they have to show that relationship there. Um, <laughs> if you heard these people, you'd realize they don't put too much stock in them studies. <laughs> <laughs> True. That's all book learning anyway. Yes. <laughs> uh, so you might think that I'm going to blow off the concept of this whole evolutionary world view as, as a bunch of malarkey, but in fact, uh, I think there's something in it. I think that there is such a thing as an evolutionary world view, and the reason I think that is because I think I have one. And furthermore, I'm going to go so far as to say that there is something about the evolutionary view that, uh, world view that inherently challenges religious beliefs. But it's not for the reasons that they think. Uh, so before I get into that, I'd like to I'd like to go through the one minute nutshell crash course on evolution, which is basically the theory of evolution goes like this: uh, at any given time, a lot more organisms are born than can possibly live productively. I mean, you know, in order to be productive, basically they have to live long enough to bear children and then pass their traits on to the next generation. They don't all do that because there's limited resources in the world, so a lot of plants and animals die young. The difference between, say, an animal uh, that, di that dies early and an animal that doesn't often boils down to very small variations in, in uh, the way they're put together. I mean, you know, they're, they're not like huge jumps like, like you always hear creationists saying, well, why doesn't a cat turn into a dog? They're things like, you know, one of them might have slightly longer legs, might run slightly faster, might yeah. be just a little bit smarter, and that happens to make all the difference when push comes to shove. So you get a whole lot of these little teeny changes accumulating over time, and as the competition winnows out the, the ones that just don't live very long, uh, in the long term, you get the world populated with a whole bunch of species that do, some, that do something really, really well, which is survive and have babies. Um, and that's just the way it seems to work. So you have competition, you have selection for, uh, for traits that make you effective at surviving, and you have survival. Um, when I say that I have an evolutionary worldview, I mean that when, when you learn about these basic, this very simple but extremely powerful idea, you start to tend to kind of apply it to a lot of other things. I mean, we have this, this paradigm of competition in a whole lot of things in our society. Uh, we, we see competition everywhere. I mean, I think it's fair to say that we as a nation are uh, more interested than most in sports for instance, mm. which is basically watching people compete with each other and one of them wins and one of them loses. Uh, we have a great big old competition which happens once every four years and happens to be <laughs> happening this year, and that would be elections. Uh, and more than that, our entire, uh, our entire uh, system of the way we do things is based on competition. We have democracy, which is electing people, and we have capitalism, 
which yeah. is uh, competing for a limited amount of money and uh, trying to you know, win in the game of producing the product that makes the most money. Uh, so I think that however, however much the fundamentalists might complain about it, we do have uh, a society which basically has a lot of respect for competition at its heart. Now, I personally uh, enjoy competition a lot. In fact, uh, one of my hobbies, uh, one of my biggest hobbies, is uh, online computer games. Um, in particular, I happen to really like online strategy games such as Warcraft. And uh, I approach uh, some of these games with the same kind of fascination with which many people approach football. Uh, I like to read about strategies, I like to be vaguely aware of who's doing well at them, and I like to know why they are. Now, I'd be the first to say that I'm basically a mediocre player myself. I get thrashed when I go online. <laughs> <laughs> but I still think the games are interesting. Uh, and one article that I came across when I was, uh, when I was reading about theory of gaming, uh, I'm going to have them put up a website, it's... Uh, it's an article at Serlin.net, which is written by a guy named David Serlin, who's a game designer. Um, and this article is called Playing to Win. Now, Serlin makes, a, makes an interesting observation, which is basically that there's a, you can tell the difference between a fair player and a really good player. He, he refers to players who are not too good at games as scrubs. <laughs> uh, I don't know what the root of that word is, but uh, I'll happily admit here that I probably am one. <laughs> but you can tell the difference between an excellent player and a not-so-good player by the way they handle losing. Yeah. Got that? I mean, you can tell whether somebody is going to win in the long term by how he handles losing. Now, what a scrub will do, according to Serlin, when he loses, he'll complain <laughs> that it's not fair. The opponent did something that was cheating. He yeah. did something that was cheap. Uh, he did something uh, that, that I wouldn't have done. Yeah. Uh, and so he lost. By contrast, an excellent player who loses a game will tend to say, hmm, I lost that game. The opponent must have done something that I didn't think of. I wonder what it was. And then he'll go in and he'll uh, think about how the game went. He'll watch the replay of the game if it's available. Um, and he'll try to analyze exactly what his opponent did that was so darn effective. He doesn't assume that that, uh, you know, well, I'm a brilliant player, so the opponent must have done something completely unfair. He says, well, that guy was better than me in one particular case. And if he finds that the opponent tried a genuinely new and unique strategy that he hadn't thought of, he'll steal it. No. He'll use the strategy on someone else if it's good. Now, what, what that does is uh, it allows him to try out a variety of new strategies, in other words, a whole bunch of variation, and he selects the ones that win. And one interesting thing that happens when you do that is, first of all, if the strategy is a good one, then you'll win with it a lot, and hence you'll increase your winning record. And if it's, and if it's not so good, then somebody else will beat you. But then you'll learn uh, uh, yet another new strategy that you can use against somebody else in the future, and you'll learn how to defeat the strategy that beat you in the first place. So uh, what good players do that scrubs don't is continue to learn and evolve their strategies through constant playing and, uh, and taking their losses like a man, so to speak. Uh, no offense to the women out there. <laughs> uh, but Figure of speech. You know what I mean. <laughs> There are, there are all kinds of things we compete at, of course. I mean, there's sports, there's chess. Uh, one reason I never got any good at chess was because I noticed that I got just got bored at reading all these analyses of famous chess games. But I guess that's how really good chess players learn, is after a certain point, they just have to pay attention to how games have been played in the past and think about the strategies that were used in that particular case. Now, 
Today is, of course, July 4th. It's American Independence Day. We're all feeling very patriotic, I'm sure. Uh, so I'd like to bring up a historical example of some scrubs. <laughs> the Redcoats. Ah, uh, yes. One of those <laughs> one of those past methods that has kind of fallen out of popularity. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, now you'll notice from a purely objective standpoint that they lost. <laughs> uh, but... You know, the question might come up, why did they lose? And I think one one great reason, and by the way, Serlin mentions this briefly in a humorous sidebar bar on his uh, webpage, but uh, one reason that they lost is because they were trying to adhere to some sort of rules of conduct in war, these rules of engagement, which were basically artificial. They were fake constructs that they made that limited the way they play. You know, you have to play a certain way. You can't put in new strategies because that would be cheap, to put it as online gamers might say. Uh, for instance, one of the things that they did was wear bright colored uniforms that were all color coordinated, which made them really easy targets. <laughs> uh, another thing they did was they would line up in these neat little rows and march in lockstep toward the enemy, and they would get shot at. <laughs> Um, but the big mistake that they made was that they assumed that the Americans also respected the, ex the same rules of engagement that they did, and they assumed that they would be fighting on equal terms. Whereas the Americans' idea for how to run a war was, let's do something that will beat the other guys. I mean, they have a lot more soldiers than we do, so how about we not wear bright colors? Yeah. How about we not march right at them, but we sneak around the side and do some kind of guerrilla tactics? One of the things that the rebels did that was particularly cute, I think, was uh, they would raise a white flag pretending that their whole regiment was going to surrender, and then the British would march at them, and the Americans would drop the flags, raise the guns, and, and uh, slaughter them. them down, yeah. Yes. Now, you know, that may get a smile out of you guys in the audience. You think, oh, those plucky Americans. Uh, <laughs> Of course, it's a little sobering to think that we don't find that so funny when the Iraqis do that sort of thing. Yeah. And it's, so it's also there, fair to mention that we still do a lot of this today. I mean, there are still rules of engagement in war. That's true. That we have today. It's not quite as blatant as something like that, but you can't, you know, just right. torture of your... Of course, you have to war. realize that there are other yeah. things to be concerned about besides just winning the battle. For instance, yeah. there's maintaining uh, diplomatic relations. You want other people to like you. Yeah. Uh, so... You know, the, the strategy of winning is complicated because it really depends on what game you're trying to win. Yeah. But um, there's still a good lesson in all this, which is that you should think about what your preconceptions are and not assume that the rules that you have in your mind for how the game works are going to be the way that everyone plays. I mean, if you were playing a game of rock, paper, scissors... <laughs> And then the opponent's strategy was to play scissors every time. And your strategy was to play paper every time. You could be like, well, that's not fair. I always play paper, and he's playing scissors on me. He keeps winning. You know, he should do the gentlemanly thing and throw the match sometimes. <laughs> Whereas what you should be doing is starting to play rock. <laughs> every time. Yeah. Because if he's going to do something that predictable, then the least you can do is take advantage of it. Um, so that's games. Uh, but I'd like to get into another arena where competition is highly valued, and that is science. Now, evolution, of course, is a science. Um, but I think in a broader sense, the whole idea of how science works uh, is based on an evolutionary paradigm, and it's basically evolution of ideas. It's everybody comes up with their own ideas, and they throw them out in the general arena of, uh, of squabbling scientists. And the scientists basically look at these views and do their best to pick them apart whatever way they can. Um, and in the long term, all the really bad ideas get weeded out by the scientists. Uh, selected, if you will, and all the really good ideas don't get weeded out, which leaves us with a really solid body of knowledge uh, that determines what we think we know these days. There's this sort of scientific gauntlet, you might say, where a, 
an idea has to go through this this sort of heavy beating by lots of different scientists and if it makes it through undamaged then it probably is a really good idea and that's another example of how competition can be good now when creationists or for instance crackpots who believe in ESP or perpetual motion machines come in and they say hey I've got this really great idea that will knock all you scientists off your feet and um, and when you realize how brilliant I am a lot of times what happens is that some scientists will look at it they'll immediately out of force of habit say well that's stupid I mean you know uh, you can't reproduce it. It violates the second law of thermodynamics. There's no, uh, there's no reason why it should work, and you haven't proved that it does work. So where's your evidence? And when that happens, the creationists or crackpots uh, will go running to the, their respective presses, and, and they'll say, you know, it's not fair. Yeah. These guys are scrubs. The, uh, the exclusionary uh, and ivory tower scientists yeah, who right. don't allow anybody else in. Exactly. So to their I day, presented yeah. this great idea to these people that would revolutionize scientists and uh, science, and all they wanted to do was pick holes in it. <laughs> kind of the point. They don't get it. <laughs> That's how science works. That's how scientists deal with other scientists. Um, the reason that you know, perpetual motion machine crackpots uh, aren't taken seriously is because they have no idea about science. Uh, they haven't ever had to deal with criticism. They might have put up a website where lots of people uh, or, or talk to their other crackpot friends who said, yeah, this is a great idea. Yeah. But they've never really exposed themselves to genuine criticism from people who don't have a vested interest in their success. And uh, rather than complaining that this is unfair, this is cheap, they're, they're being mean to me, what they should learn to do is take their losses, figure out why they lost, and use that as a way of understanding how, how to do good science in the future. Hmm. It's actually kind of odd. That just reminds me. Um, on our email list, we mm -hmm. have the Ask an Atheist <laughs> email list. It's one of the Yahoo groups. Yeah, online debate is a great way to get practice at competition. Yeah. Um, there was this one guy that showed up on the Ask an Atheist list just this week, and he started by posting this long diatribe, mm -hmm. and just how, you know, his life was hell, and then he found the Lord, and now everything's great again. Um, and then somebody said, look, this is called Ask an Atheist. If you have a question, go ahead and ask it. Otherwise, leave. This is not, you know, preach to the atheists. And so the guy follows up as anybody respectable would by posting yet another long diatribe and missive on something which, which different. Which ignored the, exactly. the original criticism. Exactly. And so then a couple people, other people <laughs> chimed in and said, look, we don't need preaching. If you have a question, ask it. And so he kind of stomped off and said, well, y'all are just so close to other ideas, and if y'all yeah. don't want to listen, then fine. It's like, dude, right. <laughs> this is how the list works. Yeah. <laughs> It's not that people don't want to hear your ideas. It's just that they'd like to have a chance to answer them. Yeah. And a lot, of, a lot of online debaters make this mistake. I mean, not just in our list, but on news groups, uh, new people who come on and they say, aha, you know, I will knock the atheists over with sheer force of my brilliance. <laughs> uh, and they've read some kind of, uh, some kind of apologetics book. Uh, yeah. Something and, in Reader's Digest. Yeah, and, <laughs> and or they've heard heard an argument on a radio show where they said yeah. this is a brilliant uh, argument and it knocks the atheists oh, yeah. out down every single time. And then they go and they carry that argument onto the online world and they realize it really doesn't work that well. And instead of learning from their losses, they they go, oh, that's not fair. I'm going to post something else, and and this will blow you away. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually they go, oh, that's not fair. People online are all mean, and then they go away, and we all do a victory dance. <laughs> First one is just a warning shot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I've seen this happen over and over again. Uh, when I debate online, there have been some real doozies where where somebody just cleaned my clock. And 
what I've done with that in the past is not use that argument anymore. Yeah. That's how you learn. Yeah. You either stop using bad arguments, or else, if you think your argument's still good, go hunt down examples, because there's tons of examples on the net, of other people who are taking the same argument, and learn from what they do. Yeah. Actually, that's what happened to me the first time, um, <coughs> soon after I found this, the, the ACA, um, I signed up on the email list, and they were having some big discussion about something. Oh, this is like four years ago, five years ago. I can't remember what it was. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I, I want to say it was something like public health or something like that. And so I post, you know, when I was in college, very few people I know who were actually into debate and discussion or anything yeah. like that. And so I, I love doing, I love debating. And when I was in college, nobody else loved to. And so whenever I got into a debate, Ten minutes into it, they would get annoyed and bored and say, "Yeah, okay, I guess you're right. Fine, whatever." That's no fun. Yeah, but you know that's kind of what I got used to. Right. And so I come onto the ACA list. I figure I'm this great world class debater. <laughs> <laughs> I post this like you know two paragraph missive on you know here's y'all are all just completely cr smoking crack, and here's the right <laughs> thing. And then every single email after that pretty much trashed everything I said point by point by point. Right. <laughs> and so I was kind of beaten into submission saying, okay. But you so learned kinda, from it, right? Yeah, I kind of went back into lurk mode for about the next year. Okay. <laughs> but then I started posting again once I read more and just you know saw how arguments went and stuff like that. I learned right. from it, from you know the method and the arguments, went back on and you know, now it's it's not a big problem. Um, but yeah, the first time they beat right. me with a big stick. <laughs> well, that's the thing about competition. Uh, you can't really learn unless you practice. Yeah. Uh, and Or unless you at least observe what other people are doing. And that's why, you know, a lot of people would speculate uh, with, with pretty good reason that if you could somehow go back in time and take, like, you know, the, the single-celled organism that was crawling out of the sludge, and you brought it to the present time, they'd immediately get eaten. Yeah. <laughs> because they have no defenses. They haven't really had a chance to, to compete. Yeah. Um, and so uh, you have to compete to evolve. And that brings me to uh, what I think of more as, as the philosophy of the evolutionary worldview, which is that you should treat your beliefs as an evolutionary process because people are fallible. Uh, people are often wrong about things. And when you find out that you're wrong, the proper thing to do is either go and, f and look for more reasons why you're not actually wrong, or just accept that you're wrong and deal with it. That's happened to me plenty. Oh. Shoot. <laughs> See, now, the my end. phone doesn't ring enough on the air, so, um, <laughs> yes, so this is I haven't had enough the radio show. with turning it off. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, where was I? <laughs> I don't know. So, anyway, I think... Okay, so, so let me bring this back to what this has to do with religion and atheism. I think that if you have what the creationists would call an evolutionary worldview, you won't hold certain ideas sacred. You might realize that some, you'll certainly realize that some ideas are better than others, and you should set it as your goal to weed out which of your ideas are good and which of your ideas are bad and try to come up with ideas that most closely match reality. I think that religion actively discourages that. I think by the very nature of religion, uh, what they do is put forth some text or some group of leaders and they'll say, this is absolute truth. It may not be questioned. Uh, it's definitely right. And when you get in the habit of assuming that what you believe is definitely right and only hanging out with other people who believe that it's definitely right, you get intellectually lazy. Yeah. Um, I don't think I could possibly put it as well as a, a great famous atheist 
uh, who, who also had this thought. So I'm going to read a quote from Douglas Adams, who died last year. Um, that was last year or the year Was it last year? Yeah, it was like two years two ago. Two years ago. ago. Wow, time That's flies. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there, there it is up on the screen. You can see the issue of the American Atheist uh, newsletter in which Douglas Adams was interviewed. And they asked him, well, Douglas, how did you become an atheist? By the way, for those of you who don't know, Douglas Adams is the author of many very funny books, particularly the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series. So here's what Douglas Adams said. In the years I'd spent learning history, physics, Latin, math, I'd learned the hard way something about the standards of argument, standards of proof, standards of logic, etc. In fact, we had just been learning how to spot the different types of logical fallacy, and it suddenly became apparent to me that these standards simply didn't seem to apply in religious matters. In religious education, we were asked to listen respectfully to arguments which, if they had been put forward in support of a view of, say, why the Corn Laws came to be abolished, when they were, would have been laughed at as silly and childish, and in terms of logic and proof, just plain wrong. Why was this? Well, in history, even though the understanding of events of cause and effect is a matter of interpretation, and even though interpretation is in many ways a matter of opinion, Nevertheless, those opinions and interpretations are honed to within an inch of their lives in the withering crossfire of argument and counter-argument. And those that are still standing are then subjected to a whole new round of challenges of fact and logic from the next generation of historians and so on. All opinions are not equal. Some are a very great deal more robust, sophisticated, and well-supported in logic and argument than others. So I was already familiar with, and I'm afraid accepting of, the view that you couldn't apply the logic of physics to religion, that they were dealing with different types of truth. I now think this is baloney, but to continue. What astonished me, however, was the re realization that the arguments in favor of religious ideas were so feeble and silly next to the robust arguments of something as, interpreta as interpretative and opinionated as history. In fact, they were embarrassingly childish. They were never subject to the kind of outright challenge which was the normal stock in trade of any other area of intellectual endeavor whatsoever. Why not? Because they wouldn't stand up to it. That's my opinion. Uh, put up that phone number I'm now. Sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let, let me just sum up. Uh, my philosophy is an evolutionary worldview, and my philosophy says hold nothing sacred. Question everything, even your most cherished beliefs. You know, people often ask me why I refuse to express the strong atheist position, which is basically I'm positive that no God possibly exists. I'm not positive that no God could possibly exist. Um, and the reason why I don't take a strong atheist position is pretty simple. It's not because I think there will turn out to be a God. It's just because the, I think the only way to be intellectually honest is to assume that your beliefs, any of your beliefs, might be wrong. And I would say that the more, the more open you are to evaluate new ideas critically, the less likely it is that you actually will be wrong. That's okay. it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, having a worldview like that, um, it applies to just about everything. I mean, you're always reevaluating your ideas and your beliefs and your views on well, yeah. life. Because, um, again, contradictory effort, evidence can come up that makes you say that, well, the idea I had before, probably not such a good idea anymore. Um, and then other ones that have worked in the past will continue to work and continue to beat out other ideas, and so you continue with those. Um, Social Darwinism, I think, is something that has kind of fallen it's out of favor. It's not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> to a certain, yes. Um, Social Darwinism, of course, was the extreme of, of Darwinist economics where they said, well, you know, they're poor. Uh, they, deserve, they obviously uh, deserve to be poor or they wouldn't be poor because yeah. uh, they can't compete. So let's let them die. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> cultures and societies. A certain amount of moderation like is called for in that kind of case. <laughs>
Yeah, but um, but even societies um, are the kind of things where if it's a bad society and it doesn't work in some way or another, then it's probably not going to last or prosper as well as another society that does. Right. Um, the American ideas are something that go across the world. Mm -hmm. You know, the BMX craze and the <laughs> skateboard craze and everything, you know, a lot of that starts in the United States and yeah. then kind of spreads well, East. you know, it's it's so. part of the wor reason that I worry about our current political climate, and I don't want to get political here, but yeah. I will say that that some political leaders, who I will not name, <laughs> think <laughs> that they have the right to be insulated from criticism. Yeah. Think that they should have a bubble around them where the only people allowed inside that bubble are people who agree with them and will tell them nice things. Yeah. And I think that's a great way to get your butt kicked in the world arena where people don't just get coddled that way. Yeah. Especially in something as important as a worldview. Yes. Now, if, if they were simply, you know, in an online game and they wanted to be in that, that's not such a big deal. No. But when you're running a country... Well, the great <laughs> thing about playing games is that you can afford to learn from your mistakes. Yeah. When you lose a game, you feel bad, but... You don't no die. No real harm is done. <laughs> yeah, you so. don't die. Your life isn't ruined. You just uh, join. You just join on the. Uh, uh, you just log in and start another game. Yeah.